Honorable Ministers of Zimbabwe and Rwanda, business leaders from both our countries, good afternoon to you. Although you have been here a few days already, I want to welcome you to Rwanda. This ga gathering is special. For a number of years now, Rwanda and Zimbabwe have been working to deepen the ties between our countries. Your presence here is the latest step in that journey and a significant one too. I take particular note of the ministers from Zimbabwe who have accompanied this delegation. I thank you all for your commitment. Be assured that the Rwandan private sector is ready to reciprocate and work with you to identify mutually beneficial business opportunities. The history of both our countries has been marked by moments of adversity and tragedy, but also success and resilience. In that, we are part of the wider African experience. Progress does not come easily or without sacrifice. It requires hard work, dedication, and self-reliance. But self-reliance does not mean being alone. No country on our continent can prosper without cooperating within our region. We have to come together, pool our resources and knowledge, and reinforce one another. The African continental free trade area provides us with a clear framework to align our interests and our strengths. But the best rationale for collaboration, as we have seen during this conference, is that we have a great deal to offer each other. So let's make the most of it and act on the outcomes of this conference with a sense of urgency. Before I end my remarks, Two things. One, uh, I heard in the presentations made to us, uh, very important things we can do together and what each country offers and so on and so forth. I wanted to emphasize uh, one thing. Uh, I think it is the deputy CEO of VARADB who mentioned in the passing the, what 
Zimbabwe can offer uh, in the area of education. You talked about uh, equipment uh, or something. Uh, before equipment, I want the people. I think Zimbabwe can offer us uh, uh, good teachers. So please uh, work on that uh, with a sense of urgency, since this is what we said. Uh, we can find whatever number you find of quality teachers, I think we, we can absorb. Be, be, because we need them, we need them uh, urgently. The second is uh, I want to send a message of uh, friendship and uh, brotherly relations uh, through the delegation of Zimbabwe, the ministers, please give uh, His Excellency, my brother, uh, President uh, Emerson Munangagwa, my greetings and best wishes. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, how are you? I'm very well, I'm very well, thank you. Thank you so and much. Yourself. I hope you're well too. I am well, I'm sure you can see that. Good. <laughs> uh, Your Excellency, let me first uh, start by appreciating you for giving us this opportunity as Zimbabwe to visit your country. We've, over the, the days that we've been here, we've learned a lot. We've seen a lot, we have observed a lot. And I believe the colleagues here, they share the same sentiment. We want to also appreciate the wonderful work you're doing of transforming your country into a futuristic country. When you look at the way, the strides that you are making in Rwanda, we as young people on the continent we are filled with hope. We are filled with a lot of aspiration. And as leaders, I believe we are taking a lot from what you are doing. Ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate the president. Thank you. Your Excellency, I want to take the privilege of being the first one to ask you my question. As a, as a leader in Africa, um, I, I lead an organization in Zimbabwe. It is a media house, AB Communications. I'm sure colleagues here, they, they now know who AB Communications is. It's a media company with radio, newspaper. We are in that space. But this COVID-19 pandemic has brought a lot of challenges to us as leaders. Um, and I also believe everybody in the house uh, no one's life has remained the same uh, amidst this pandemic. When I look at us living today uh, as corporate leaders and heads of ministries, and I look at you as a head of a country that went through a very difficult uh, past, uh, what comes to mind is the genocide against the Tutsis, but with, that such, with such a background, you've managed to pick up the pieces and drive the people, lead the people, and show them the way and achieve what you've achieved. My question to you is, as a leader, what are the secrets? I want the tips. I want the nuggets. What are the tricks? How do I lead amidst all that negativity and adversity? Thank you, sir. Well, um, 
I, I don't think there are any tricks or shortcuts or, or that there is any magic. After all, as, as people, as human beings, we are going to do what is humanly possible. We cannot uh, do things out of that scope. But I guess with every individuals, with the people of countries and, and so on, they've got to look at the challenges before them. We have, as you said, we have had tragedies of different kind. I mean, uh, the worst tragedy our country faced uh, 27 years ago. But it is not just a tragedy that just happened. It really has a history to it. It is one of those things that only happens and exposes the history of the problem uh, and the problem that built up of built up over many years and then ended up in that kind of situation of genocide in fact just like uh, even this pandemic we talk about the covid-19 which has affected the whole world one thing one needs to observe carefully. We see problems associated with COVID-19. But if we observe carefully, COVID-19 has also exposed our weaknesses. Things that were not right, things that were not in place, or the thinking that has not been operationalized so that when a, a tragedy like this or a pandemic like this happens, then you, you simply deal with it the way you must deal with it. You find people are taken aback, it's by surprise, it's something that is insurmountable. It's just, but really all it does is exposes uh, weaknesses in countries, in societies, in how things are managed. I mean, one quick example is, in our case, uh, Africa, meaning or Rwanda, we f discover that we haven't made sufficient investments in public health. That, that comes out straight. And then you start even wondering, you say, why didn't we make the investments are along before. Or we did not think about, which we are now beginning to think uh, about, manufacturing of vaccines, different pharmaceutical needs. Because we always waited and we are happy to keep receiving them from abroad, if I may. So, now, therefore, to, the, to your point, back to your point, the, the tragedy that befell our country in 1904 wasn't just uh, something that happened uh, either by accident or by coincidence of some kind, and therefore we have to deal with it. No, we have a history that over decades that led up to that. So when dealing with the, the, the problem, like that one, they say in Rwanda, there are choices to make. First, you define the problem, as, as therefore give it that history. And that means quickly that you've got to think of how do I address the root causes, those actually problems that led to this to happen. Even before you think about dealing with the actual situation itself, there and then, we are already thinking about how did it happen? How did we get here? And then from there, you've got to make a choice. Can we change the situation? Can we do things differently and avoid that history 
and therefore also avoid that kind of problem happening again in the future. So that, that's how we approached it. But of course, it, it, again, all of a sudden, not everyone is going to think like that. So that's how it takes people, leaders. And, and leaders also are not going to address such a problems alone. You, you've got to create a kind of infrastructure that is going to bring in everybody, because everybody is affected. In our situation, everybody was affected. So it is everybody that is going to be involved with better understanding of what our problem, or what caused our problem, or what our problem is, and then work together to address it. So in our particular case, it has been the politics, it has been the economics, it has been how socially people relate, Therefore, we had to take a hard look at this problem and uh, face the hard things uh, we had to deal with and deal with it without excuses. Yes, if we had excuses, if we were to look for excuses, we would have failed. In fact, already people had uh, cast us as uh, a failed state. It was a failed situation. People did not give us a chance. They, they, they thought there was no tomorrow for Rwanda. It, 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 is, it is gone. So, but we, we had to rise to the occasion and, and deal with the matter. And, and I, I guess other people dealing with their own problems can also be successful or make good progress uh, in dealing with them. Thank you. I think uh, I got my secrets. If I can summarize it for you, ladies and gentlemen, get to the root of the problem, involve the people. As you, as a leader, you are not going to solve it alone. So, thank you once again, Your Excellency. Now, let me take this opportunity to open to the floor for a few questions. I'll take, and uh, Your Excellency, you, His Excellency will sure. respond. Thank you. Okay. Uh, where are my mics? Okay, yes, sir. One thing we've learned quickly, there's discipline in Rwanda. There's discipline. There's, we learned there's extreme discipline in Rwanda. We are very impressed, Your Excellency. Please, can you share us the secrets of the strategies of this discipline so that we take it back to Zimbabwe, to the private sector, and to government? <laughs> Well, that's one area that uh, gives us uh, a great uh, investment opportunity, so we can work together on that. <laughs> but uh, on a serious note, again, I, I guess the, the discipline comes from what I said earlier, that hard look at the problems of any nation, by anyone. And then in dealing with those challenges, if you are set out, you have set out to involve people which must be the case, it has to be translated into what people see as their benefits as well, directed to them. 
the people must see that what they are faced with and what they must address, if they address that, they are the beneficiaries. That's what I'm talking about. Second, like in our case, as we set out to deal with our problems, in fact, we already having in our minds the kind of end state we want. You, 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 you start on a journey of dealing with the challenges, but you're already having in mind the destination. So you are, you are driven with that. And so that sense of urgency, that clarity on where you are coming from and where you want to go, and then the involvement of people and linking that with their benefits and showing it to them. That's actually the role of leaders. You, you explain, you show things, you, you know, so that in a, maybe a few days, weeks, months, or years, people start seeing benefits. So they feel the benefits. Then they are focused on that. So that discipline is about the focus that is generated by the sense of urgency and therefore the benefits that are going to be derived from dealing with whatever challenges you have before you. So it, it, it's theoretically, I mean, that's what it is. That's what I can say. But I can see your, your, your point also in saying, okay, Theoretically, you can say that, but how, how do you make it work? Because that's where problems develop. Uh, that's why you will find people make more progress than others, maybe in, a, in a similar situations. It's not because they could not define what the issues are and approach to them, and so maybe all of them have the kind of knowledge of how to deal with the issue. But when it comes to the real practice, the, the, that's where the difference comes up. So uh, 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 I don't think I'll give you a, a completely satisfactory answer because on the theory side, on, on the side of defining what the problem is, we may be together and, and even how to approach problems, but in practice, you will find there are these variations which, which I can't fully understand, but it will always depend on whether any situation had the opportunity for leaders to emerge that uh, would stick to what needs to be done and work with the people and then get to where they want to go. So we, we can continue discussing that and make the necessary investments we said we could make. And, uh, yeah. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, I'll take another question. Right on my right there. Thank you, Excellency. My name is Ferdi Turasenga. I'm a Rwandan, uh, doing business both uh, here as the headquarter, also uh, doing business in Zimbabwe. We have an office based in Harare, uh, at Samura Mashel 146, for those who are from Zimbabwe. So, Your Excellency, um, I'm not, it's not a question, it's actually appreciation and a contribution, because I remember I turned 10 years old when you just liberated Rwanda, and uh, there is a slogan in Zimbabwe where they say, Zimbabwe is open for business. I think everyone here knows that slogan. I want to say that Rwanda means business because I'm really a product of, of, of the change and the reforms that happen in this country. You can imagine 10 years old, today I'm uh, 37, and I own a company that's listed on Rwanda Stock Exchange. 
Um, uh, it's called EPC Africa Group, but the, the subsidiary of EPC Africa Group is uh, listed in the Rwanda Stock Exchange. We are an IPP, what you call independent power producer. And when I went to Zimbabwe as in vacation, I realized there was an opportunity in the energy, and I started a business in Zimbabwe because I know, because I know everything is possible. When during the pandemic, when everyone was running away, I found the opportunity, and today we are doing business, and uh, I'm encouraging so many uh, Rwandans, even Zimbabwean. And since I understand that this uh, trade corridor of Rwanda and Zimbabwe is important if it works both ways, I encouraged so many Zimbabweans. And today, I can tell you that we have a strong investor among the team, Mr. Exodus, who, is, who has, uh, Your Excellency, he has, he's going to invest, in, he's very strong in housing, and he's looking at our market and putting a lot of houses here for affordable housing. So I'm encouraging the people, uh, being Zimbabwe and Rwandan, to really ride in this highway that our two excellencies are building for us so because we share so many being past even the future. Thank you, Excellency. I think, uh, I, I think if I may just react to that, I think that's uh, wonderful. And the, my conclusion to that is let's do both. Let's be open to business and let's mean business. So I, I think if we... Thank you. I'm sure, Minister Lof, you've heard that Zimbabwe is open for business and let's mean business. Thank you. Um, I'll take my last question uh, before our conclusion. Uh, in the middle there. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, there's been a significant and clear mind shift change that has happened in Rwanda which I think is responsible for the significant growth and development um, that we have seen. You have spoken in your address about hard work, dedication, and self-reliance. You also talked about a destination. And what I wanted to ask you, Your Excellency, is to say what do you see for Rwanda in the next five to 10 years? What is your vision for Rwanda? Thank you, Your Excellency. Building on all that uh, you, you, you've referred to that has been said, for one in the next 10 years, we, we, again I use the earlier being on the journey. We, we are on a journey uh, in search of prosperity, development. Like if you put it to uh, in some technical terms, it's either today we are low income country, we want to be medium income country, upper medium and, and higher. So, but it's not just about level of development also. As you think about that, you think about the stability of society, our society, and in particular Rwanda, where we have come from. Uh, I think we've been building uh, toward being a nation. In, we may have uh, diversity in our society, but that gets to be resolved for the unity, the strength of the country. So that development, that prosperity I'm talking about, which we must achieve, we must achieve on the basis that every Rwandan benefits, irrespective of their religion, their whatever has divided us in the past. So the vision is, we, we've already made uh, some little progress. We want to make more, maybe two times what we have already achieved. Uh, or if possible, three times. Why not? The, the, I think we, we, we 
should not limit ourselves to how fast and how much we, we can uh, get bearing in mind where we want to be. So really that is, uh, it's trying to do better, do more of what we are doing already uh, and taking our people to that level of development where development, instability, and people become comfortable with that and we need to have that. Thank you, excellent. All right, um, let me also take this opportunity to congratulate you for finally uh, winning a game, Arsenal. <laughs> We're about to win more. <laughs> Um, my final question to you, uh, Mr. President, is on the, on the sponsorship. Um, I'm on Twitter, I follow you. I've, I've read so many, so many negativity, uh, you know, sadly from African people. You know, we are Africa, we are poor. Why are we giving money to those guys? They are millionaires. My question is, what has been the impact of that... Um, activity, uh, that intervention, how has it been? Well, I think negativity arises uh, out of just confusion. Yes, I, 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 ju I, just, I don't think those people know what they are talking about. <laughs> I, I really don't think they know what they are talking about. Because if they imagine that Rwanda just started spending its money anyhow, like that, and, and in fact, giving it to those who don't even need money like I do, like Rwanda does, I think that's where the confusion starts from. By the way, not only are we working with the Arsenal, uh, we are happy to do that, and uh, I've been a fan of uh, Arsenal Football Club for over 30 years, maybe 35. But we're also working with uh, another uh, football club, uh, Paris Saint-Germain, the one in, in France, in the French League. Now, of the several pillars of our development. In fact, one of them is tourism. We've invested in tourism and in infrastructure and you know, trained people around services that go along with that and, and so on and so forth. But tourism, you need the visitors. You need uh, people to come and enjoy what the country offers. The beauty of the country, the experience, and so on and so forth. In fact, <laughs> the, the story might be long. Let me try to see how I can. It's the same confusion even our own people had one time. When uh, after 1994, maybe around 98, we, seven, eight, we started uh, building uh, infrastructure, you know, with limited resources. We built uh, a hotel. I remember, at first it was managed by Intercontinental, then uh, the town was bought by Serena but it was built initially on government money. And we were attacked, being attacked by people here and there, saying government is wasting money, oh, we are building a five-star hotel, what? They really thought we were stupid. So we, we just kept quiet, we said, okay, maybe after five years we will get to understand what we were really doing. Can you see how long it takes some people? So, but the, 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 the strategy was 
because we were already building up the momentum for development of tourism. And when you are having tourism, you, well, there are these ones, uh, the backpackers, the, the others who really have money and want to spend it. So I was thinking about them. If people want to spend their money on the beauty of the country and the experience, and they come and have nowhere to stay, or you have limited them to some place they are not comfortable with, then they may not come. But if they know they will come and uh, play, uh, stay in a good hotel, they will stay. So you can see the contradiction here. People are saying you are wasting money building up this infrastructure, but the infrastructure was built for a reason. And in a short time, in fact, the hotel did well. And uh, as I was telling you, we sold it and paid off the loans. And we, we, we did not build it, as, build it as a government to run hotel business, no. We built the hotel so that when it serves its purpose, the private sector may take it over and run the business. And for, but initially, you can't, government cannot dictate to the private sector and say, put your money here, put your money there, put your money in, no. The, the, the private sector puts their money where they want, not uh, where I tell them to put it. So in this case, if I had waited to tell them to build a hotel, a five-star hotel, they would not have built it. But because I built it and it was there standing, then the private sector gets attracted and say, oh, you know what? I want that hotel. It's different from telling the person you build the hotel or you building it and then selling it. So for the sort of tourism, the, the, the investments we made, the partnership we have with the Arsenal has actually attracted more people who have brought to the country more money than we have given Arsenal. <laughs> so, you don't have to be a very sharp businessman. I'm not one, but I think on this one we got it right. So that negativity is... <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but on the other hand, by the way, it's not so much the Africans who have been negative. I, I may even disagree with that. Actually, it has been... Either, if it is Africans, there are few, but they teamed up or used the outsiders. Because I've seen some uh, writings in the British papers, not written by Africans, no, but by those people there, saying, you know, Rwanda is wasting our money because they give us aid, right? <laughs> and they think, they <laughs> but even then they are mistaken. If you give me aid, how do you want me to use it? Or why would you dictate to me how I use it? If, I, if you can give me 50 million, and in using the 50 million, I'm able to earn the country 300 million, how would you, why would you blame me for that? There must be something wrong in the... So, but they, they, then they, they politicize it, they bring it into, you know, use it for politics. They, it, it, this is why I say it's just confusion. But uh, we are happy with the partnership with Arsenal. Even happier that I'm the fan of Arsenal. <laughs> and uh, we are now doing well with the P PSG and uh, I'm uh, now a good fan of PSG. And uh, I tell you, uh, if we, when you come back and you have time, we can go into numbers. I will show you how 
It is working very well for us, and I think it is. <laughs> and it is very well, working very well for those we have a partnership with. I think, um, Your Excellency, you are a shrewd businessman. <laughs> Contrary to your disclaimer. <laughs> Thank I, you, ladies I, I'll do business in my next life after <laughs> this. <laughs> Uh, thank you. You've been a wonderful uh, audience. I would like to um, take it back to, to my boss, Madam Louise. Your Excellency, we appreciate your time. Thank okay. you so much. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.